Amen. Glad you're with us. Will you stand with us? Let's sing the powerful name of Jesus Christ. Hymn number 202. <clears throat> Excuse me. Hymn number 202. Sing all four verses with me as we sing of his powerful name.
eternity shall return he shall return to gather together his saints and his church sing it with me he shall return in robes of white the blazing sun shall pierce the night and I will rise among the saints my gaze Praise the name of him who sits on the throne. Oh, praise the name of the Lord our God. Sing it with me. Oh, praise. It's a wonderful day to be in God's house. Amen? Amen. And uh, we have people uh, joining us by live stream. Some of our most dedicated and long-term members are in high-risk health groups and, and watch by live stream. And they won't be back in this room possibly until there's a, a vaccine. And uh, to them this morning, I say First Baptist Church, greet you, we uh, put our arms around you, even at home, and we want to tell you that we have not forgotten you. And uh, we, we've even saved empty pews just for you, so that when you come back, uh, there'll be a spot just for you. And so, so I want to say that. I also want to say this morning that for those of you that are here, I appreciate your endeavors to keep us all in our, our best safe spots. And so uh, this is that moment where I typically share the Bell County COVID numbers. Tiffany, have you got that one? 
she's digging in the slides there for them but but I want to tell you that they're coming down we're down about 50 percent from where we were at a peak two weeks ago can I get an amen on that how about that and uh, you see, from, I mean, the peak was scary, but, but it's coming down and coming down, and today's number was, was down again. And uh, whatever we're doing, I, I don't know if it's a combination of, of sanitation, if it's social distancing, if it's the hot Texas heat, if it's the mask, whatever it is working, I praise God that it's working. And so if you'll keep doing what you're doing here at the First Baptist Church, here's my hope, is that our name be in the newspaper for something really good right? Baptisms are up, missions giving's up, but something good. I don't want to be the COVID church. That's kind of a nickname that would be hard to shake off. That FBC, we want that to be church, not COVID. And so if you'll keep taking those precautions around the building, we greatly appreciate that. We wear a mask coming in, uh, kind of like a restaurant. Once you're settled into a little spot where you feel like you can breathe, you can take that off if you need to. But if you're moving around the building, please, please wear those, and, and we greatly appreciate that. Social distancing. I want to hug some of y'all so bad. I'm so saving one up for Kay Cosper. I, I, I just, she, she comes to church for a hug, and she hadn't had one since February, and so I, I'm just going to give her just one big lifetime hug uh, when this is all over. We, I'm saving you one up, sister, but, but I want to tell you that. We have been doing touch-free church, so we haven't been passing out bulletins. We don't pass the offering plate. In a few weeks, we'll do the Lord's Supper, and we'll do these things differently. Uh, we did add a, a little bulletin this week, but it was put in here three days ago so that no one touched it in the last three days. So if you're not afraid to touch that, there's just an a, a announcement or two, and then on the back is a place for you to take some notes uh, on, this, on the sermon sermon as well. Uh, let's see, what else? If you're a guest with us today in the back of the pew rack, there is a little visitor's card, and if you would fill that out, we'll try to give you a phone call and figure out how we can connect our church with you even in these awkward days. The offering plates are at the back on your way out if you'd leave your offering. If you would also leave the information card, the visitor's card, there at the back. Uh, we, we'll try to be back in touch with you. Having said these important things, I'm looking around and I'm not seeing somebody that I'm looking for. I'm gonna, uh, we're going to make a staff acknowledgement, but if, if uh, Matt's back chasing teens, then we'll catch up with him in a few minutes, right? Uh, because we want to do that. So we'll move forward a little bit more and I'll catch him at sermon time. If I don't catch him at sermon time, I'll catch him after sermon time, but uh, uh, working with uh, the young people in the building is certainly critical uh, right now. So we're going to uh, pray, and we're going to move forward in our time of worship. Father God, thank you, Lord, that you are glorious, that you are excellent, that nothing surprises you. So, Father, on the days that we're caught off guard, when life is interrupted, when our society is suspended, when the economy screeches to a halt, when church is different, you're not surprised. And so we look to you, we cling to you, and we hold the fact, God, that, that when we can't hold on, you'll hold on to us. And we praise you, O Lord, because you are glorious and mighty and beautiful in all you do. It's in your name we pray. Amen. the people that uh see the people that the pastor was just looking for here right there so we'll catch up with them in a second we've been learning this song recently man a beautiful song a beautiful text <clears throat> i um i hope that you'll engage with it it is uh, it is a tough time that we live in right now in 2020 the pastor just spoke to that hopefully we've seen the light at the end of the tunnel and that is uh beginning to to curve upward uh, or downward, whichever way you want it to curve. And we're having to see good news. But man, this song is a, a beautiful song of struggle, yes, but of hope beyond struggle. And that the Lord is my salvation. It is not wrapped up in whatever other thing we may concern ourselves with in 2020. But the Lord is my salvation. We sing this beautiful song of hope. The grace of God has reached for me and pulled me from the raging sea and I am safe on this solid ground 
The Lord is my salvation. And in times of waiting, in times of need, when I know loss, even then, the Lord is my salvation. Sing it with me. In times, in times of, of waiting, waiting, times of need, when I know loss, when I am weak, I know His grace will renew these days. The Lord is my salvation. Who is like the Lord? Who is like the Lord our God? He's strong to save, faithful in love. My debt is paid and the victory won. The Lord is my salvation. Will you sing eternity celebration? When I reach that final day. When I reach the final day. He will not leave me to the grave. But I will rise, he will call me home. The Lord is my salvation. Who is like the Lord our God? He's strong to save, faithful in love. My debt is paid and the victory won. The Lord is my salvation. Who is like the Lord our God? Strong to save, faithful in love. My debt is and the victory won. The Lord is my salvation. The Lord is my salvation. The Lord is my salvation. Amen. You may be seated. Several months ago, we had the anniversary of Matt and his family joining us in Colleen, Texas, but it was during COVID, and it was in the time when we had no crowd at all, and so we were, we were only live streaming, and I just thought that it was a little too bare bones for us to try to make a staff acknowledgement, so we just uh, let that thing lapse a little bit, and we're realizing that we need to get caught up on this, and uh, so it's March. 2020. Can you pretend with me for just a moment? And uh, in March 2020 was when the Cornelius family moved to Colleen, Texas to join our church staff and uh, they moved in from Alaska. And you've got to imagine this, that, that Abby was about just big enough to sit in my lap and ask me to read her a book. And that moment's frozen in time, by the way. You, you can be a grandmother someday, and in my mind, you're still going to be about 18 months old, Abby. And uh, watching your family grow has been a great delight to me as well. Uh, I wanted to say a, 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 a couple of words. And uh, uh, one was, uh, Matt, that some things you haven't done Okay, when, when you have a minister on your staff, he represents uh, us to the community, and you've not embarrassed our Lord in any public way that I'm aware of, all right? You and God may have to talk, but I, I don't have an issue. You, you've not embarrassed our church in any way, and you've not embarrassed your family in any way. Now, they may be individually embarrassed at a, at a volleyball game or something, but the integrity of a minister is not to be taken lightly, Amen. And, and you pick up the newspaper, there, there's thousands of churches in America, and every week there's somebody who embarrasses their Lord, their family, or their church. And so I want to thank you. You, you get about a, a C plus just by not doing the wrong things. 
Okay. Now let's talk about what he has done. Uh, Matt has been youth minister for all four of my sons. I've, I've watched them enjoy camps, uh, disciple nows, uh, just the time scale that you have them in your home. And, and all those little middle school boys sitting in the couch eating brownies. All right. And they didn't cook the brownies. You, you cooked the brownies. But all of my sons have enjoyed the hospitality of your home and many, many, many other teenagers. Don't you wish you had a log book of who all had come through the door? It would be like the New York phone book uh, is, is what that would look like. There's a lot of things that I could say uh, about Matt, but I, I want to tell you, he makes great lemonade. Okay, uh, so when, when things don't go quite right, he figures out a way to take that and to squeeze it and add some sugar and uh, just great lemonade, brother. 12 years of, of lemonade, uh, like this morning, two minutes ago, he's back there, you know, he's back there with the teens. He, he's doing his work and we want to have him in here just so that we can give him a hand. And, uh, and, and he, here we are, just, we're just going to do it again, lemonade. I asked Patty to say something complimentary about Kayla because uh, she's better at that vibe than I am. Would you help me? Well, the main thing about Kayla is that, um, first of all, I consider you a dear friend, and she's always been so kind to me, but also kind to everyone, um, to youth parents, um, whether they were being nice or not nice, um, just very stable and um, consistent and always supportive of her husband, and I so respect that about her. But the main thing that I would compliment about the Cornelius family is that um, as parents, they've led their daughters to minister, and I've seen them minister at camp, just praying over, over teens, um, leading Bible studies, and I, I so respect that about your family, but I also want to thank Matt for helping us raise our boys, like Randy said, so Kayla, these are for you. I hope that, I hope that, that will take your family to your favorite restaurant. Hopefully so. Love you, brother. Thank you. Love you, brother. Try not to embarrass your daughters. <laughs> yeah, they, they would probably disagree as far as the embarrassing them, but they learned fast when uh, they were little not to announce that I embarrassed them too much because that's when I would go Jim Carrey on them and amp it up about 400. So, but just uh, thank you all as a church family. Thank you all. Wallace says it's been a joy and a privilege to be here for, for as long as we have, and, and I think that's the testimony for the length of time that we've been here is that we have a great church family and, and great support, you know, from the staff and just all across. So just thank you all so much for that time uh, that y'all poured into us and invested into us. There's just so many of y'all that have poured and in, invested into our girls and into our family. And we wouldn't be here doing ministry if it wasn't for y'all. So just thank y'all for, for all that you do and the love and the support that you have for us. And we look forward to, to many more years. Stand up. Come on, folks. I need you to stand for the people who aren't here as well as for the people who aren't here and give them a robust, robust blessings. Thank you. And I'll take that applause as a warm-up for my sermon as well. Patty, can you give me my Bible? I don't want to run back down there to get that. I've always wanted to have applause when I stepped in the pulpit, but I've never been worthy of it. So uh, I'll, I'll shirt tail on yours. Thank you. <laughs> yeah, yeah. That's, that's like an amen you have to ask for. I mean, you know, did you earn it? Yeah, either way. The church in free fall. I, I don't know how you're feeling about uh, the overall programs and ministries of the church and that there's churches on both the East Coast and West Coast that are not meeting at all. Uh, some are... are um, being told by the governments they can't meet others are choosing not to meet but at, at the end of the day it's kind of hard not to feel like uh, that all of the exposed threads are being tugged on when the the, the new testament church to be viable we, we've got to connect with one another and the thing about this uh, virus and pandemic is that the main message is is don't spread it so don't don't get together and so anything that you imagine that church does, choir practice, oh, we get together. Prayer meeting, oh, let's get together. A fellowship, oh, bring some fried chicken, oh, let's get together. Someone has a crisis in, in need, the scripture says go to them and, and bring the elders and pray of them. Oh, we can't bring the elders, they're in the high risk group. I mean, it, it, it just seems like everything that, that is, uh, is in the synergy of the church seems to be, uh, to, to be withdrawn. 
And, uh, and I just kind of want to say that out loud because I think of this all the time. This is my all-waking thought. This is my calling. This is my vocation. It is my passion. It is my love. This church is where I've poured out many years of life and ministry. And not just this church, but other churches as well. I believe in church. I believe that the church is the bride of Christ. I believe that it is the organism that God placed here when Jesus ascended into heaven. It's, it's, it's his plan. It's his battle plan. It is, it is his schematic for success. This is how our soul, culture and society is to thrive, particularly in Christ through the church. And so today, the, the thought of the, the church in free fall. I, I don't know about you, but, but it's, it's kind of like, are we or aren't we? Now, I, I, I want to bring that to the front and, and saying, are, are we seeing the, the death of the church? And, and in a hundred years, will, will churches in America look like the churches of Europe? And then I, I, I think back, well, when did the churches of Europe die? Was it a little each day or was it during the, the plagues or during, you know, during these, these crises of wartime uh, of, of destruction? Now, in that, I, I want to uh, bring you to Acts chapter 5. And there's this really interesting verse out of context. I'm going to pull it right out of context, okay? I, that's not a good Bible study tactic, but I just got to tell you that, that when I read that verse, I thought, wow, that sounds like us. In Acts chapter 5, verse 13, uh, the scripture says, no one dared to join them even though they were highly regarded by the people. This is, is Peter, and they're in the temple, and they're preaching in the temple courts, and, and no one would, would join them. And I think, how many people uh, have a high regard for the church, but they don't want to join us because of their own personal risk? I, I say that without condemnation of those who are choosing to stay away for their own health, but I just said, you know, that, that, that just kind of struck me there. But continuing this text with Acts chapter 5, verse 17, the scripture says, oh, let, let me just give you the backstory. Miracles are happening and everybody wants to hear the preaching of Peter. Then, verse 17, the high priest and all his associates who were members of the party of the Sadducees were filled with jealousy. They arrested the apostles and they put them in public jail. That sounds like free fall. When, when the pastor of the church, when the leader of the movement has been arrested and placed in jail, you're like, well, that, well that's, that's not good. And we hear this around the world. It's still a tactic used by oppressive governments. They won't go arrest the whole congregation. They arrest too. They will arrest the pastors or the leaders out of those congregations. They arrest the apostles and they put them in public jail. But during the night, an angel of the Lord opened the doors of the jail and brought them out. Go stand in the temple courts, he said, and tell the people the full message of this new life. At daybreak, they entered the temple courts as they had been told and began to teach the people. When the high priests and associates arrived, they called together the Sanhedrin and the full assembly of the elders of Israel, and they sent them to jail for the apostles. But upon arriving at the jail, the officers did not find them there. They went back and they reported, we found the jail securely locked with the guards standing at the doors. But when we opened, we found no one inside. On hearing the report, the captain of the temple guard and the chief priests were puzzled, wondering what could come of this. Then someone came and said, Look, the men you put in jail are standing in the temple courts teaching the people. At that, the captain went with his officers and brought the apostles. They did not use force because they feared the people would stone them. Having brought the apostles, they made them be appear before the Sanhedrin to be questioned by the high priest. We gave you strict orders not to teach in this name, he said, yet you have filled Jerusalem with your teaching and are determined to make us guilty of this man's blood. Peter and the other apostles replied, we must obey God rather than man. The God of our fathers raised Jesus from the dead, whom you killed and hanged on a tree. God exalted him to his own right hand as prince and savior that he might give repentance and forgiveness to, of the sins of Israel. We are the witnesses of these things, and so is the Holy Spirit, whom God has given to those who obey him. When they heard this, they were furious, and they wanted to put him to death. But a Pharisee named Gamaliel, a teacher of the law, who was honored by all the people, stood up in the Sanhedrin, and he ordered that the men be put outside for a little while. Then he addressed them. Men of Israel, consider carefully what you intend to do to these men. Some time ago, Thetis appeared, claiming to be somebody, and had about 400 men rally to him. 
He was killed and all his followers disappeared and they all came to nothing. After them, Judas the Galilean appeared in the days of the census and led a band of people to revolt. He too was killed and all his followers were scattered. Therefore, in the present case, I advise you, leave these men alone, let them go. For if their purpose or activity is of human origin, it will fail. But if it's from God, you will not be able to stop these men. You will only find yourselves fighting against God. His speech persuaded them. They called the apostles in. They had them flogged. Then they ordered them not to speak the name of Jesus, and they let them go. The apostles left the Sanhedrin rejoicing because they had been counted worthy of suffering disgrace for the name. Day after day in the temple courts and from house to house, they never stopped teaching and proclaiming the good news that Jesus is the Christ. I read that this morning, and I'm contrasting what looked like the church in free fall with the church actually falling into place. The first thought that I had here is that it appeared that the church was falling apart. In verse 17, it says that, that they had them, that, that, that uh, 17 and 18, that, that they were jealous, the Sadducees, and they arrested the apostles and they put them in public jail. And that's not a good day for the church. Can you imagine it's Tuesday of vacation Bible school and they come in and they just start arresting people? I mean, that's the kind of crowd thing that was going on. This was, this was a feeding frenzy of interest in the gospel. People being healed, people being saved, a transformation. This was, was right in the throw of it. This, was, 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 this wasn't a, 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 a sideshow. This was the thing that was happening. One time, Patty and I were, went to the, the movie on a date night. We went to see the hot movie that night was Titanic. It was the big romantic movie of the season. We'd gotten sitters, and it was Friday night. And we're driven from Frankston up to Tyler, about a 20-mile commute. And we're in the movie theater, and there were storms in the area. And right in the middle of the movie, they turned off the movie, and they turned on the lights. And the manager came in, and he said, folks, we're under a, a tornado alert. He said, there's tornadoes been started, uh, have been sighted in our area. He said, uh, we're going to restart the movie, but we just thought we ought to tell you. <laughs> I'm looking around. I'm thinking, is, is this a good place to be? <laughs> now, I, I said, Patty, we're leaving. Because our kids were the babysitter 20 miles away. We, we know the electricity goes out out in the country, and when there's storm, I said, I said, we're leaving. I said, I know 800 people are about to die on this movie, but I don't want to be one of them. <laughs> I have never seen the end of Titanic. I, I, I think I saw enough of it to get the gist. The ship sinks and yada, 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 right? Okay, so um, interrupted. The main thing is interrupted, and, and, and the main characters are arrested and placed in jail. But as Joseph said, what some intended for evil God was going to use to his good. Now, an angel comes and he delivers. Can you imagine how much courage that gave them? They didn't slip out the back door and go hide. An angel came and gave them this charge. He says, says go back and teach the whole gospel. Go back and teach them everything about the gospel. During the night, an angel of the Lord opened the doors of the jail and brought them out. What beautiful power that is. And brothers and sisters, I, I've got to tell you, the power of the church is not a committee. The power of the church is not a budget. The power of the church is not the history of the church. We have those things. But the enduring power of the, of the church is the Holy Spirit manifestation of God. It's that lives are changed. It's that every one of us sitting in these pews have a before to go with our after. And that we come together to celebrate what God has done in our midst. And God continues to be at work in our midst. And God continues, the, the, the baptistry is full today because in the second hour we're going to baptize. God continues to save the lost. He continues to deliver the addicts from addiction. He continues to save marriages. He continues to give hope to the businessman. God continues to give hope to the struggling widow or widower. Brothers and sisters, the gospel has not gone out of business. Amen? And the gospel hadn't even gone on furlough. 
It just morphs into a different form when we say, okay, we're, we're, we're not going to meet in that venue. We're not going to meet in that place. We're not going to schedule evangelism for 5 o'clock on Monday. God is still an evangelist. And he still works in his dynamic ways. And the church wasn't falling apart. The church was falling into place. Four points here, if you're taking notes there in the bulletin. First is that of power. And it was the power of God that came and released them and set them free. Second, it was the power of obedience. This never would have been a better story if upon being released from the jail, they went and hid. What amazes me, verse 21, the very thing that got them arrested, the next day they're right back doing it again. At daybreak, they entered the temple courts. Daybreak, they could barely wait to get there. Have you ever been that charged up to be obedient? God's given you a mission. He's given something to do. He's put you on point, And you're so excited about being there that you can't wait. That's a beautiful place to be. When you know God has put it on your heart and you cannot wait to obey Him. Now, many believers, honestly, I, I'll tell you this, you're not asking God every day for what He wants you to do. You're not getting marching orders because you're not set holding still in front of Him saying, Lord, what would you have for me to do today? Some days He will tell you to witness. Some days He will tell you to serve. Some days He will tell you to simply be, be faithful. Some days He'll tell you to be still in His presence. Some days he will draw you into the fellowship of a, a personal fasting. God directs you day by day. And if you listen to him, he will give you his instructions for you to be obedient to him. And you can't wait to be obedient to him to prove that you heard from God and to watch and see what he's going to do. Because when God tells you to do something, it's not for no reason. It's because he's up to something and he's inviting us to be a part of what he's doing. And so his power is revealed and then this beautiful obedience of them continuing going back at daybreak to teach in the temple courts. They've already said we must obey God rather than men. They've already been told not to do this. They've already suffered this consequence of going off to jail. They've already proven in their character what they're devoted to doing. Keep in mind, this is Peter who failed Christ on the night of his arrest. But God has retooled him back to a vibrant purpose. The church was falling in place because the power was still there, because obedience was there, and because they had perspective. What do I mean by perspective? Yeah, you can watch a terrible story on the evening news of someone who died of, of a disease, and you go, oh, we, we have to all fear that disease. Or you can say, well, look at it mathematically, and it's like uh, 1% or 2%. You're like, these, these terrible things that have happened to some most likely won't happen to me. That, that gives me perspective. Now, I still, let me tell you this. If I bought a ticket on an airplane, and there were 100 seats in the airplane, and they came on the loudspeaker, and they said, folks, we've got to tell you something. When we're halfway mid-flight, one of these seats is going to fall out of the bottom of the airplane and one of the 100 is going to die. Would you want to be on that airplane? I don't want to be on that airplane. I'm like, wait a minute, I don't want to be one in 100. It, it, it doesn't sound bad statistically unless you think about the, the reality of being the one. But perspective does help. When I know that one day, one bad day, doesn't erase my life. One failure does not erase God's love for me. One failure doesn't take Jesus off the cross. One failure doesn't remove me from God's love or his heart perspective. Look at verse 38 with me, would you? Verse 38 in reference to perspective. I appreciated the amen earlier when I read this verse. He said, let them go. If their purpose or activity of a human origin, it will fail. Brothers and sisters, that's a very relevant word to the church. If coffee was holding your life group together, it's probably going to fail. Because people can get coffee someplace else. If sports stories were holding your fellowship together, well, there ain't no sports. Well, what are we going to talk about? Well, I guess we can't meet. If it's of human origin, it's going to fail. And I realize that there are apparatuses within the church that meet human needs that we still need to have to meet human needs. 
When there is human suffering, we need to relieve that. When there is loneliness, we need to relieve that. When there, there, people have a need for people. Total strangers are stopping and talking to each other these days because people desire so much to connect with one another. But if it's of human origin, if it's just about us and not about him, that church maybe should die. But if it's from God, you'll not be able to stop it. Amen? Amen. But if it's from God, you won't be able to stop it. And we want to be the generation of the church. Oh, there's a great generation before us, the history of First Baptist Church. There were times in this church's history where the building wouldn't hold everybody. They had to go and rent the downtown movie theater. And that's back when going to the movies was still thought of as sinful. And the church was renting the movie theater because they couldn't get everybody together into the church building. There were seasons where the 100 people were baptized every year for 10 years running. There have been some marvelous seasons in the history of First Baptist Church, Galen. Because God was up to something. But if it's from God, you'll not be able to stop these men. You'll only find yourself fighting against God. Brothers and sisters, the church is still viable because the church is still the apparatus of God. The Bible that says that we are the body of Christ and that every part has a part is still relevant as much now as it was before COVID. Perspective. Verse 41 says this, The apostles left the Sanhedrin rejoicing because they had been counted worthy of suffering disgrace for the name of Jesus. Wow. What perspective is that? Every now and then I come across somebody who has been wounded in the service of the Lord. Now, it's not usually in America a physical wound. It's usually an emotional wound. They, they tried to minister and they were rejected or they were tried to minister and they were insulted. They, they, they tried to befriend someone who was, was in trouble and that, that cost them emotion and it scarred them. And I say, would you just for a moment read this verse? Is it possible that the times that we get wounded in the suffering, uh, the times that we get wounded in the serving of Christ identifies us with the suffering of Christ. What amazing perspective for men who had been beaten, flogged, and jailed to say we rejoice that we have been able to share in the littlest bit in the suffering of Christ. And brothers and sisters, church is a nice place to be. I've seen a few in, in my whole life of ministry, I've seen a few rude moments in church. But I've never seen anything in church like you see on the streets. I, I, I've, I've never seen people bloodied by physical conflict. I've never seen anybody shot down in, in conflict. I, I, you, know, you know what I'm talking about? The, the nasty stuff that goes on in this world. And if you're out in this world, you may encounter some of that. You may be the peacemaker trying to stand between two people that are fist fighting and you get socked in the nose. Well, blessed are the peacemakers. But I got socked in the nose. You may get taken advantage of. One dear lady came to me and she said, you know, this, 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 this Christian friend, this, this woman, she asked me to pay her cable bill. And she said, I was just, I felt sorry for her. I paid her cable bill. But then she said, I felt so stupid because I don't even have cable at my house. <laughs> and she just felt taken advantage of. Now Listen. Being the church should cost us something. And I'm not talking about your tithe or offering. Being the church should cost of us some of our time and energy that we would come alongside someone who is wounded, someone who's struggling, someone who hasn't arrived yet in, 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 their, in their social skills or their hygienes. Being the church should cost us something. And when it does, it should, and when it does, we should rejoice because we were counted in some way worthy of the sufferings of Christ. That's an amazing perspective when you think about what God needs the church to be and what he wants the church to be. And yes, today there are still martyrs in our world that die for the cause of Christ. Because they stood up, because they spoke, because they ministered, they have been persecuted unto death. There are others who are oppressed, dramatically oppressed. A friend was telling me about his home country where uh, Christianity is legal, but the ruling majority is Islam. He said, if you're a Christian, you're never going to get a good job. 
If you're a Christian, you're never going to be able to get a decent house. If you're a Christian, your kids can't go to the schools. Suffering for the cause of Christ. Oh, wouldn't it be easy just to blend in and get along? But for those who choose to be distinctively the body of Christ, when we suffer, if you'll gain perspective and say, you know, Jesus didn't have it easy either. I saw a cartoon once, and it was of a, a, a hippie from the 60s. You, you remember, young people, you understand what I'm talking about. But uh, these were people that were rejected by society because they were wearing their hair long, and uh, they, they, they had beards. God forbid, they had beards. I heard a preacher one time in Arkansas as I was a young man. He said, when you get saved, you get shaved. It's just, I mean, that, that, that beard run Christian. Now listen in for a moment. The, the cartoon had a, a, a hippie character that had been left out of the church. They, 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 had, they wouldn't let him in. And sitting on the front steps in front of the church was a character of Jesus, also with beard and long hair. And Jesus had his arm around the hippie. He said, it's okay, son, they won't let me in either. Perspective. <coughs> Suffering, disgrace, for his name. And then let me say a word of mission. Verse 42. Day after day in the temple courts from house to house, they never stop teaching and proclaiming the good news of Jesus Christ. You, can you minister out there? The church is being tested to see, can, oh yeah, we can do it here. We can do it with a program. We can do it with a committee. We can do it with a budget. Will it work out there? When you're put on point, front lines to encounter, does the church still work? Got a message this week. One of our members was trying to help a woman in need, a disabled woman who'd gotten behind on one of her bills. I love this message. She said, I know this woman personally. She's in a tight spot. She's $130 behind on a gas or electric bill. Here's the part that got my attention. The church member says, I've paid the first hundred. Could the church cover the rest? She's paid the first hundred. It's $130. She's paid the first hundred. Could the church do the rest? Of course, the answer was yes. What struck me was that one of our members was out on point encountering people in need. Secondly, she was willing to use her own resources in order to help Third, she had already invested in this person that she could tell me this person's not a drug addict, they're not dysfunctional, they're not abuser of the system, they're simply somebody in need. How easy was that for me to say yes? It's like, let the church be the church, amen? Get on point, find what needs to happen, and help make it happen. And that is the church on mission. And it doesn't take a budget, it doesn't take a committee. It doesn't even take a mission statement for us to get out there and still be the church. And when that happens, we will come back together rejoicing. Amen? We'll come back together rejoicing. I, I want to, I'm, I'm going to include that passage from Corinthians right now if I could. The body is a unit that's made up of many parts. And through all its many parts, they form one body. So it is with Christ. Brothers and sisters, we're still the body. And we're still all the parts of the body. Teachers still must teach. Organizers still must organize. Prophets still must prophesy. People of mercy still must show mercy. The, the, the gifts are still valid. And we're still in need of each other, interconnected. So it is with Christ. So we were baptized in one spirit in one body, whether Jews or Greeks, slave or free, and we've been given one spirit to drink. Now the body is not made up of one, but many parts. If the foot should say, because I'm not a hand, I do not belong to the body, it would not be for that reason cease to be a part of the body. To our people at home live streaming, I'll say you're still part of the church and we still need you and God still needs you connected to the body as a whole. It's through relationships that we're connected to one another. And it's for the ministering purpose so that the eye might see and so that the hand might act that God uses the body. And I'm going to tell you that over and over again, the Bible speaks of the church, the bride of Christ, as passionately relevant, as relevant as Jesus on the cross dying is us showing Christ to the world. 
See, if he died on the cross and nobody knows it, then it's ineffective. We are the ambassadors of Christ. In the worst circumstances that the world can dole out are still no match for the power of God. And so speaking of free-falling, I ask this question. What have you fallen out of? You say, all, all of our meetings have been suspended. I, I've, I've fallen out of this. I, I'm, I haven't been teaching. I haven't been this. I haven't been that. What have you fallen out of? Many good Christian habits may have been broken during this. Have you fallen out of some of the disciplines that link you to the obedient instructions of our Lord? Have you just quit having your quiet times and your Bible studies and your scripture memories, your opportunities for service? You know, I'm, I'm wearing a mask and nobody knows it's me. I can't even smile in Jesus' name. Guys, y- y'all know this. Uh, my smile is my asset, right? Not my nose. The mask shows my nose. But, but I, you know, it's like, can I get a mask up here? We're lo- we've lost some of our automatic opportunities. But the words that come out of your mouth can still bless people. A, a simple word to someone, how can I pray for you? And you don't have to hold their hand and breathe on them and pray for them. You can pray over the phone. What have you fallen out of? And then what have you fallen into? See, the, the church looked like it was in free fall, but it all fell in place. It became exactly what God wanted it to be. It became the New Testament church. What have we fallen into? Is there a new opportunity? Is there new availability? I hope that you've not fallen into, as some in the COVID season have, self-indulgent behaviors just sitting around waiting for a cure a treatment or a vaccine some have fallen into alcoholism some have fallen in out of going to the gym into sitting on the couch what have you fallen into and possibly have you fallen right into the place that God wants you to be a family falling back together because soccer got canceled and ballet got canceled. A, a, a family falling together. A home-cooked meal because eating around your dinner table because drive through is just not as much fun as it used to be. What have you fallen into? And is it possible what you've fallen into is what God desired for you all along? Here's my closing prayer. Dear God, I want to fall into your place for my life. Okay? I just want to land on the X, where, wherever God wants me to land. Out of all the momentum of rearranging my life, I, I, I want it rearranged in a way that pleases God. I want to fall into your place for my life. Correct me, empower me, and put me on mission. I don't want to correct you, but the Holy Spirit does correcting us from inactivity correcting us from waiting for the church to have a program to do it correcting me from anxiety and seeing defeat where God is still at work correct me empower me because without God it's just human effort and surely fail and put me on mission are you a hand get busy are you an eye get busy Are you a heart? Feel it. Are you the voice? Speak it. On mission. Closing with that verse. And the word of God spread. The number of the disciples in Jerusalem increased rapidly and a large number of priests became obedient to the faith. You pray that prayer with me. Dear God, I want to fall into your place for my life. Correct me, empower me, and put me on mission.
Father, I pray that the generation behind us will find us as the generation that was faithful. Even under the most disrupting circumstances, the power of Christ was not denied in our life. And Lord God, I pray that you would energize the obedient, that they would know that they don't robotically go through obedience, but they go through that relationally, that you are there with them, hands and feet. Unlock us from our captivity of fear. Send us back to the temple courts to preach that Jesus is alive and well. In Christ's name we pray. Amen. We're doing our invitation a little differently. You know, in our Baptist tradition, we would have me down front, and I would be inviting you to come to Christ. Today, I have a faithful minister at the back door, and as we're singing this invitation, if you simply go get close to Stephen back there, you don't have to say a thing to him. He'll say, follow me. We'll go back to the library. And you can have a quiet conversation across a six-foot conference table about what God is stirring in your life, the ideas, the, the, the thoughts that you're having, the compulsion of your heart. I also realized at Vacation Bible School, we did an invitation this style. As people are leaving, I say, if you want to visit with one of our ministers, if you'll come sit on one of these front rows, I'll look over there and notice, well, he's just sitting there. And I'll put on my mask, and we'll have a conversation about what God might be up to in your life as well. Don't leave here without acknowledging that God is speaking to you about your life and asking Him what He wants you to do in these days of challenge. We're going to stand and sing right now. You respond as the Holy Spirit moves you. Have thine own way, Lord. Have thine own way. Thou art the potter. I am the clay. seated or remain standing I'll make this short uh, go ahead and be seated I guess because uh, you, you know me I'll try to be short but I can't always do it hey uh, we do have and I wrote about this in the newsletter uh, the email newsletter and by the way if you are not getting the newsletter make sure you send us your uh, email address uh, give us your permission I guess that uh, we we can send it to you even if you're a first-time visitor today hopefully you filled out those forms but give us your permission to do this but what we have is we ordered way back in March and you know what March was like our Sunday school material we just thought it would be the normal summer slump we had no idea it would be this much of a of a downturn of our attendance and so if you want some of this material uh, we have it to give to your friends to, for you to use to share with other Sunday school members uh, I wrote about that they could even come by or if you even want us to come to your house and deliver it to you we'll do that just be involved in uh, your spiritual growth and as uh, Randy preached on our Sunday school material for the uh, uh, family uh, Bible studies for life is going through why we need the church you are the church this building is not the church, so we are the body of Christ. If God lays something on your heart to minister to, 
That's the church. Isn't that what you preached on? That we are bodies of the church and we can be actively involved. It may just be dropping off a few magazines here and there to Sunday school material here and there and just be doing something that's practical. So use our church resources that we have uh, and get involved. We are uh, slowly and having different Sunday school classes. So just contact us if you'd like to be involved, especially those of you who are new to our area, new to our church. We'll be glad to you, uh, get you activated in these times. All right, Pastor? Thank you, Tim, and thank you to everyone who works live stream to make a Sunday school group work by Zoom or, or whatever apparatus. Uh, we're, we're, we're trying to stick it together, trying to keep together, and we look forward to today where we'll all be back in some semblance of uh, old normal. I'm not even going to say new normal. I, I miss the old normal. We're going to move from the, uh, the building now. We've got a group coming in in the next hour, and so we'll be cleaning pews and switching around. The people in the next hour set in different pews than you set in, so we move the pew markers, and uh, they, they wipe the doors down, and we, we try to get everything everything sanitary for the next group. If you would, uh, uh, don't crowd up around the doors on your way out. There's a exits this way, this way, that way, and that way. And, uh, and, and again, this is the new handshake, all right? Uh, or if you're really excited to see them, you can do it like this. And uh, I'm not quite sure. The Pentecostals may, this may mean something different. For, for me, it means hello, all right? Uh, and so, so anyway, uh, give everybody a good wave and uh, make your way gently out of the building. Uh, mask up, and God bless you. You're dismissed.